welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jesse Graven from the Gardener's Workshop. Today, I'd like to share some clips from an interview that Lisa recently did on the Urban Farm Podcast with host Greg Peterson. Here, they discussed Lisa's book, Vegetables Love Flowers, and also covered topics such as beneficial insects and creatures, the importance of native plants, succession planting, and starting a three-season cut flower garden in your vegetable patch. Here it is. I hope you enjoy. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm for another month in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. And I am here with Lisa Ziegler. Welcome, Lisa. Hey, so glad to be here with you today. Thank you. All right. Well, tonight we are here to talk about growing flowers to love your vegetables. Lisa is a cut flower farmer, author, and online teacher of organic cut flower gardening. She has been farming since 1998 in southeastern Virginia on the Ziegler family homestead. In season, this urban three-acre farm produces thousands of stems of flowers and an abundance of vegetables weekly. Lisa has sold her flowers to florists and supermarkets and at farmers markets and her members only farmers market. That's cool. We might want to talk about that. She loves sharing the experiences she gathers from day-to-day life on the farm. In recent years, Lisa's business, thegardenersworkshop.com, has grown into an online garden shop and learning center that includes resources and online courses for gardeners and farmers. Welcome, welcome. Hey, so glad to be back here with you again. Thank you. So, Here's the description Janice shot over to me, and I'm excited about this. Every vegetable garden can benefit from having beautiful flowers in and around the area. Beautiful blooms can boost the aesthetics and add a wild palette of colors. Some flowers can repel unwanted pests, and some flowers can bring in healthy pollinators. Some flowers are even edible. Let's get to know Lisa, and where do we even start? So, you know, I think that people are kind of surprised by the subject of my book is how your vegetables will definitely benefit from Mm -hmm. flowers, but Mm -hmm. it's not in the classic way that so many people think. Which is bringing in pollinators. Well, it is. It's bringing stuff in, but it's not so much plant this flower to prevent this disease or to prevent this pest. It is You know how we kind of eat to make our bodies healthy, to kind of like fight off illness? Well, it's the Mm -hmm. same thing with your garden. And to have a healthy garden, it truly starts with flowers, you know? Oh, yeah. It rolls out that red carpet to all Mother Nature's workers. And, you know, why would we even try to do the heavy lifting when she's already provided it? We just have to invite them in and not kill them with pesticides. And that even includes organic pesticides. pesticides. We use nothing. I use nothing. I have been organic for 32 years here at the urban farm. And are there bugs here? Yeah. Do I have a pest problem? No. Yeah. I mean, they, when you get as many or more of the good guys and there are the bad guys, you don't even know they're out there because they're taking care of your problems without you really thinking about it. And I know that sounds simplistic, but I'm the living and you are the living proof of that, you know? So, but it doesn't happen overnight. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. So where do we start? Well, I mean, I think you need to start at the beginning. And that is that, you know, folks, when, when I wrote the book, Vegetables Love Flowers, the challenge that the publisher gave me was that more vegetable gardeners need to understand just how significant a piece of their garden is missing by not having vegetables, not having mm-hmm. flowers. Mm-hmm. And so I spent, I kind of went to work really figuring out, you know, for people, it's like, you know, cause when I would speak and I teach about flowers, right. Afterwards, somebody will come to me and say, why would I give up, you know, a portion of my vegetable patch to flowers? And it's like, you just don't know what you don't know until yeah. you plant them. Um, but flowers are the basic. They're the foundation of every great organic garden. If you really truly want to be organic and you're not growing flowers, I don't know how you're doing it because the flowers don't just attract pollinators. They attract beneficial insects. That's Those are the Navy mm. seals of the garden, you know, all, and there's so that. many There's thousands and thousands of them. If there's a million insect types of insects in the world, there probably um, are less than 1% of them are truly harmful. All the rest of them 
are useful in some way. They're somebody's food source. They're, they, they are part of this chain. And, you know, you don't have to get deep in science to figure this out. And, you know, what I share in that book that it just kind of, I was not smart enough to recognize this by myself. I started flower farming back in 1998. I was literally an overnight success. And what that meant was I couldn't plant enough flowers for the demand that I had. And so you plant more and you grow more and you're selling more and all the things that go along with doing that, all the business stuff, all the everything. Well, I buy about, I would guess about the third or the fourth year, I was so overwhelmed and overcome. And I started having, you know, it takes a couple of years for you to start having problems when you start gardening, right? I mean, to get serious problems in a greenhouse or out in the garden, it doesn't really matter. And so about three or four years in, I've got, you know, the most horrible flower farmer bug ever, thrips. That's actually a big Mm. problem for vegetable growers too. Yep. And And fruit growers. Yes. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Drips are a problem. And I tried to battle them. I followed IPM, integrated pest management steps, and spent a lot of money on the specific, you know, product to use. And I about killed myself trying Mm -hmm. to do it. I mean, it's very labor intensive to practice that kind of stuff. And so after a season of doing that, I finally just said, all right, I'm done. I'm just stepping back and letting y'all duke it out. I didn't really consciously think of that when it was happening. But when we looked back what happened over the next couple of years, I just basically stopped using everything. (laughs) And in about two years, my garden just came alive. Um, With everything from, you know, the ladybug, of course, is the poster child, right, of the good bugs. She is the BB in the Astrodome of all the workers that are available to help you manage your garden. But here's the thing. You can't use any chemicals, none, zero, and you have to plant flowers. That's what brings them in. You know, I know that beans have flowers and peas have flowers and tomatoes have flowers, But if you want a workforce that'll make a difference in your garden, you have to plant some flowers. And, you know, our recommendation is 10 to 20 percent of your garden space needs to be in flowers. And yes. And here's the reason, because for most of us, there's three seasons. There's spring, summer and fall. And Mm -hmm. for you to have a constant source of blooms in your garden all the time you have to do a little bit of succession plant it doesn't have to be a large portion but you have to plant something to bloom in the spring then you have to have something that's going to come on in summer and it's really much easier than you think but you have to give it some space because I'll tell you perhaps the the story that I remember the most after speaking at a conference and guy came up to me afterwards and he said well you know I tried that flower planting in my garden once I said you did so tell me what you did and he's and he had this fairly large vegetable patch I mean it was like 50 by 50 that that is a big garden yeah Yeah. that's a big garden you know what he said to me he Mm. said I put a pot of marigolds in the corner and it I just didn't (laughs) see any difference and it's like I I literally had a group of people. I took him aside and sat down and literally, because the book, I hadn't written Vegetables Love Flowers yet. Uh I literally schooled him. And you know what? He went home and planted flowers. I can promise you that. Because people just don't understand that to get all these amazing workers that we see featured in books and people talking about them in articles, to get the, you don't have to buy them online either, (laughs) y'all. Right. You know, all you want your locals. Like, yeah. You know, and you know, the other thing that I think that discourages some people, you know, we're working hard enough as it is to master growing whatever it is we're growing and doing it well. Yeah. Then they learn about beneficial insects and they think, oh, you mean our pollinators, let's just say, for instance. Then people, many people will share, well, you have to plant this specific flower to get this specific insect to come to your garden and be beneficial. And that is definitely true. But Mm -hmm. here's the way that I've gone about it. I've only planted those flowers that I was already growing. And guess what? They all attract tons 
of pollinators and beneficial insects. You know, zinnias, who doesn't want to grow zinnias in your vegetable patch? Right. I mean, butterflies everywhere, which is what so many people really just love sitting and watching. So what I want to say is the real key ingredients are the no chemicals, no pesticides yep. at all. And you have to plant flowers to bloom continually. Wide diversity. You don't, yep. you don't even have to specifically grow specific flowers. You just need to have flowers. You know that here, so I'm in Southeastern Virginia. So we're in mid-February. We're actually about six six to seven weeks away from our, from our last spring frost. While it was 60 degrees today, it's going to be 22 degrees in two nights. Wow. So this is classic Virginia. But I have a huge little Linton Rose shade garden. It was so alive with native bees this morning. You know, you just, when you start learning about these guys, you start to realize, oh my gosh, there is not a thing in my yard blooming right now. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about the dead of winter. I'm talking about the end season when these insects are active. Right. And, you know, you just, it's like I tell people now, this is a lifestyle. It's not just me to teach you how to grow flowers and to do it without pesticides, which we've been doing it that way for two decades. So it can obviously be done. And, you know, it's just, it's a lifestyle that once you get in here, you'll never look back and right. you just think of things very differently. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I went back to college in uh, 1999, uh, later in life, uh, one of the things that I did for fun and to make some cash was I went to the farmer's market once a week. So I was farming my yard and going to the farmer's market and I took, you know, 10 to 15 bundles of flowers every week. Those were the first things that went at the farmer's yeah. market. So if you want to go that way, you know, and go to the farmer's markets, grow cut flowers because people want them, right? Pet flowers are very universal. Yeah. You know, growing them and enjoying them as cut flowers yes. on both sides. And totally agree that there is, you know, and there's a huge movement going on in the domestic cut flower industry. That means local, basically, domestic. Yes. That yes. means, so it's just like the whole slow flower thing, you know, right? But with the pandemic, basically shutting down the cut flower industry worldwide, it was a big tsunami kind of effect. So the pandemic happened on March 13th of 2020, right? Yep. But the minute that everybody started closing down, I watched many of my friends who were event florists and farmer florists they lost their businesses in just a matter of days. You yeah. know, people that their whole business was, you know, high end flat on um, weddings within five day window, everybody canceled. And so that craziness lasted for about 10 days. Yep. Then all of a sudden everybody's realizing, you know, there's local growers for the local growers are the, 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 are the night on the white horse to come riding in. It took time, but that effect, it hasn't even peaked at its worst yet because oh. when that happened, uh -huh. all of these out of country growers had to destroy millions of dollars of product. Wow. Many of them went out of business. Many of them were afraid to regrow for the later in the season or they lost their workers or their workers can't even get across the border to work for them. Yeah. So what has now snowballed is that local growers are shining bright. And, but we are in a pickle because we're trying to teach people how to be professionals and how to meet the... Yeah, exactly. Talk about succession planting. That's a topic, a, a concept that I like people to understand, not just for vegetables or fruit trees for fruit, but also for flowers. Talk, talk, sure. Tell us about that. Sure. So, you know, as earlier I'd mentioned, if you really want to get these nature's workers into your garden and keep them there, mm -hmm. you have to have constant flowers. And first off, the whole point of the book Vegetables Love Flowers is planting a small cutting garden in your vegetable patch because there's no better way to keep the flowers reproducing constantly than cutting them every week. You know, you pick the tomatoes, uh... you cut the flowers. You do it every week, right? But still, we still succession plant because we want to have flowers. We want to have flowers all season long and we want to have good quality flowers. So what we do typically, it depends on what your, 
your your growing season is. I mean, it varies for everybody, but we'll just talk about warm season. That's warm season tender annuals. You know, those are zinnias and sunflowers and coxcomb and some of the celosia blooms, just those beautiful, long-lasting cut flowers uh-huh. that pollinators adore. And so they're great to have in your garden. Well, we would plant what we would plant a small spot, you know, a three by five foot cutting garden will give you a big bunch of handful handful of flowers every week. Wow. Yes, it's for a home. No, but but is that enough to bring the pollinators in? Oh, sure. It depends on how big your vegetable patch is. As I said, 10 to 20 percent of your square footage, because Uh, here's the thing. If you plant a three by five spot, as soon as you can plant warm season stuff, when you put the first tomatoes in, you put that little cutting garden in. Then we do it every four to six weeks. We plant another little patch. Mm -hmm. Then you plant another little patch. And that way, if the first patch were to happen to be damaged from weather, a storm, pests, or anything, Mm -hmm. you have a backup plan. And succession planting on our farm is a little bit different. We plant warm season crops over and over and over again. And we actually do it with cool season also Mm -hmm. because you don't want to plant your entire farm or garden at one time. First off, that's a lot of work all at one time. Right. By succession planting, instead of planting an entire acre, you plant a quarter of your acre. And then six to seven weeks later, you plant another quarter and you just keep this whole rotation going. And it is really not complex at all. Um, There's actually diagrams in the back of that book, Vegetables Love Flowers, that because that's really the secret, isn't it, to any great garden whether no matter what you're growing herbs vegetables or flowers is the succession planting yes no question whatsoever no question i mean turns out the work well not only that and i guess i just never until i became friends with a local organic big vegetable grower i never knew that vegetable growers plant here where we are plant a big crop of tomatoes right before mid-july That's how the farmers has awesome tomatoes in the fall. You know, they aren't picking those killer tomatoes in fall from those plants they planted, you know, the very first early in spring. Mm -hmm. They succession plant. They succession plant tomatoes and peppers big time. And I just never had grasped that. And that really led me down this path that we succession plant so much. It is so beneficial for you, your workers, your garden, whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. One of the things that you also said was like 1% of all the bugs out there are bad bugs. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you get this a lot. I get it a lot. Oh my gosh, I have ha 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 in my garden. How do I kill it? Yeah. You know, our brain is wired to figure out if there's a bug or a mushroom or a weed, it's like, how do I kill it? And we have to start shifting that. You know, when I used to do so many in-person programs where I do a slideshow, there are three beneficial creatures that I would always forewarn before I hit the slide because there are people that are a little afraid of them. Mm -hmm. The three most powerful beneficial creatures in my garden Mm -hmm. are snakes, spiders, and wasps. The three things that people are terrified of. And guess what, friends? I was terrified too until I understood what they were doing. What if one of the number one cash crop losses that we would ever experience on my farm was from voles. I don't know if you have voles. Voles are uh, garden mice basically that live underground and they eat the roots. You'll come out and an entire crop is just wilted. They'll eat everything. They'll eat everything. Well, I tried, I even practiced a little voodoo trying to get rid of voles. I'm telling you, it was so bad. And then I got into this restoring nature mode that I was learning about. And guess what? Adding a couple of rock piles in my garden, not being afraid of snakes, providing a little bit of habitat. And I'm here to tell you that for 12 years, we have lost zero. That used to be our biggest loss every year. Wow. We have zero loss from bowls now. It took a couple of years, mm-hmm. but it works. Spiders are some of the most, what do they eat, y'all? Not people. They eat other <laughs> bugs, right? right? Yeah. Right? And once you realize that, it's like, 
holy cow, all those spiders are out there eating. You know, I told, we um, often joke here on the farm, we use a biodegradable film on our bed tops. It looks like plastic, but Uh it's actually a corn byproduct. It's black on one side and white on the other, or gray, Mm -hmm. light gray, like white. And you use the light colored side up in the summer when you're planting so you don't toast your seedlings. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you what nobody else thinks about. In the summer, after we have planted some new beds that the plants are still fairly small, I can sit out in the garden doing little tasks like weeding or something. Mm -hmm. And you just cannot believe how many spiders are in our garden because of that What light colored top. You can see them scurrying around. Yeah. I'm telling you, I think if I knew the number, we might move. I mean, they could <laughs> they could take us down, I'm pretty sure, but they eat other sure. insects. And here's right. the best one. There's uh-huh. no one more scared of a wasp than me. I mean, yeah. I'm the girl that if I was driving down the road with my window down and a wasp flew in my car, I'd jump out the door with the car still going. I mean, I used to be that mm-hmm. freaked out over them. But then all I had to do was to witness one day, what do wasps do? They eat other insects. And what is one of their most delightful meals, especially for their not yet born babies, are caterpillars. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. You know, all those caterpillars that get on our broccoli and our cabbages, they get on our tomatoes. Those wasps will come and take those caterpillars. Sometimes the caterpillars are so big, they can't even get airborne long enough. They have to touch down going. They sting the caterpillars to to freeze them, I guess, you know, to stun them. Then they wrap them up. They take them to where they've laid their eggs in a little hole in the ground. They push them in the hole, backfill the hole. And then when their babies hatch, guess what? Fresh food. I mean, nature is amazing. Well, and I've heard wasps will actually lay their eggs inside of other bugs. Oh, yeah. Parasitized. That's a different kind of wasp. Oh, ah, okay. And yeah, so the, the good old tomato hornworm, you know, the big green guys that yeah. really the big that green guys. can be guys, literally three inches long. But they grow into some amazing moths. They are really cool, but you, of course, don't want to eat in your tomatoes. But parasitic wasps lay their babies on those hornworms and then when you, if you find a horn a corn, one of those tomato worms with all those little white plugs on the back do not kill it those are all beneficial little teeny wasps these aren't the big ones mm-hmm. and they're actually sucking the juice sci wi-fi i mean this is like horror movie stuff right <laughs> right absolutely anyway so those three very frightening creatures are some of the best to have in your garden, but mm-hmm. people eliminate them, which explains our whole problem Yeah, in a nutshell, right? Big time. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so I had a professor of, is it entomology? Bugs, yeah. right? A yeah. professor of entomology from one of the local universities here come into my yard and she, uh, delightful lady. And you know, I'm 32. I'm right in the middle of Phoenix. I have this oasis of plants. I mean, it looks like what's behind me with trees right. and plants and bushes. And it was amazing to watch her walk around my yard. She was seeing these teeny little sit on a head of a pin bugs flying around. She knew what they were. They were bees. And she knew which ones were the males. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And, she, you know, she enlightened me. Apparently, there's thousands of different kinds of, of native bees that are yep. small like that that aren't honeybees. That Yep. You know that um, honeybee always gets the headline. And most people, I have nothing against honeybees. My neighbor has 19 hives and his bees are in my garden All a lot time. of the time. Yep. But, you know, honeybees are imports. They're not native. You know, they Mm -hmm. came from Europe. But yeah, we have thousands of native bees right outside our own back doors that you don't have to provide for them, except don't use pesticides, plant flowers. Right. We have a large colony of what are called longhorn bees. They're little native bees. Uh And um, it's because we grow so many black eyed Susans on our farm as cut flower crops that we have them. And I didn't know what they were either. And I call him a bugologist. Um, one of our, our local entomologists, he uh-huh. would come and he said, you know, it's because 
There are so many flowers here. You have so many amazing creatures that live here. But the longhorn bees are really small, but they have really long antlers. Oh, and yes. They, they're so beautiful. And they cuddle up together and sleep on the flowers. And it's really pretty sweet. So this is what happens to you, y'all, when you farm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, I've got some questions here from, from our listeners. Carrie, I think I'm pretty sure Carrie's in San Diego. 10 to 20% flowers for a veggie garden. How much diversity of the flowers might be a good place to start? Sure. And, she said, and she says, oh, okay. Succession is the key also. Yeah. So what we, we kind of tend to plant those flowers that are just great cut flowers. Mm -hmm. And that means that they come and cut, you know, you cut them and they continue to come back. Zinnias are certainly at the head of that line because mm -hmm. people love them. If you don't have a great love for the flower, you're not going to actually cut it. So we really love planting those. I mean, there's a mix of about five or six, you know, sunflowers are another great one, but they're only one flower per stem for the kind that we plant. So you have to plant right. them a little bit more often, but they're really mm -hmm. beneficial. And I tell you something that we plant with our cut flowers that people really adore, and that is lemon basil, because that oh, yes. makes, your, it makes your bouquet smell as delightful as it looks. And it does go on yep, yep. to develop a beautiful flower and the bees are just crazy for it. And so you don't have to plant. That's where a lot of people get, they kind of fall off. You don't have to plant a bunch of different flowers. You know, if you planted a little patch of zinnias and a little bit of basil and maybe a couple of sunflowers, I actually have plans in the book that you can follow, but that's the place that to start. And the thing is, plant some sunflowers as soon as you can plant your first tomatoes. Then about six to eight weeks later, plant another patch of zinnias. So when the first patch starts to wane or maybe they get mildew, you can just pull them out and you still have this patch over here. And you don't have to change it up because guess what? As much as people love zinnias, your butterflies, oh, your mm -hmm. bees, all of them will continue to visit your zinnias. And coxcomb is another just strong mm -hmm. pollinator mm -hmm. drawer. And it's a great cut flower because you have to cut them every week to keep them constantly replenishing. And that's the real secret. Nice. Anne wants to know, will my snapdragons receive themselves or do I need to save seeds and plant them again next season? So that's a great question. Snapdragons can reseed. It really depends on what variety you have. Some of them are hybrids and aren't strong reseeders. Um, so I would say to you, I would always plan on starting again and see after a couple of years kind of what's going on in your garden so that you can actually judge that. But we don't rely on reseeding for stuff that we really want. We yeah. always plant a little bit to cover our bases. Yep. Yasmin wants to know what to do about flea beetles. Anything? Flea beetles, the bane of our existence. We can't grow eggplant here without covers because of that. So flea beetles, I do not know who the natural predator of a flea beetle is, but I'm sure that there are definitely beneficial insects that probably eat them in their young stage. Mm -hmm. But the way that we protect our crops, eggplant are what really attract them, is that mm. we cover our eggplant plants immediately following planting, leave them covered until they begin to bloom because they need to be pollinated. Yep. And then if you take the lightweight row cover off, even if the flea beetle gets on them that late in the game, it doesn't do enough damage to harm your crop. So preventing the flea beetle access would be... Chat need to be over here in the Q&A. A number of natural predators can be employed to keep flea beetles in check, including two that parasitize it, brachinoid Ooh. wasps and trachinid flies. That was just there, a Google search. There you go. And yeah. so, and you know, what I can't emphasize enough is creating this environment in your garden mm -hmm. of no pesticides, constant flowers. You have all of these creatures and, and these bugs that we're talking about, the good guys, coming into your garden. And so you don't have to go out and shop for that. You just have to maintain a space that rolls out the red carpet. And you just can't imagine what is going on at how that doctor came to your garden and was seeing things that you probably have never noticed. Never noticed. 
Exactly. You have to go out there and spend a few minutes and just sit and watch. And if you do it where flowers are, you will be amazed. Dill flowers. Oh my gosh. Oh. Bring them in by the truckload. Carrie wants to know, she said, new, here's a newbie question. Is there a days to maturity for flowers? Yes. And they sometimes you'll find that on the seed packet. If it's not on your seed packet, a quick search engine search. I mean, I tell people that all the time. If somebody asks me something I don't know, I just put it into a search engine. I'm sure that's, that's what, what you. That's what I just did for flea beetle predators. Yeah. Part of the part of the problem sometimes is you don't know the question to ask. Yeah. You know. Well, so so when she asked about the flea beetles, it's like okay, we're looking for predators. Right. So you put the two together. Exactly. And so once you figure it out, it makes it so easy. So there are quick maturing flowers and then there's some that aren't so quick. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons we grow Pro Cut, the series Pro Cut Sunflowers, that's the name of a family of sunflowers. Mm -hmm. And we grow Pro Cut because they're 55 to 60 days from seed to bloom. Mm -hmm. So that means they're super quick, right? Yeah. Um, they're also pollenless, but do not let that alarm you. They produce a ton of nectar. So they are still very mm. beneficial for pollinators, but to be pollenless makes them a long cut flower. They last a long time in a vase. Pollen kills vase life of cut flowers. That's why oh. so that's a significant character. But then there's other flowers that take a longer time to mature. So yeah. you really have to look up each one, but in general, cosmos, zinnias, sunflowers, most of them are not super quick, but quick enough that you can plant them and get results by midsummer usually. Yeah. Peter wants to know any flowers that grow in Florida. I would say all of the flowers that we've been talking about will grow in the right season there, correct? Exactly. All yeah. the warm season tender annuals thrive there. And you can even get away with some cool season hardy annuals. My book, Cool Flowers, about them shares the concept of that, of where he would plant those in the fall, like many of us do, to get them to bloom, get established before the heat starts. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Tris wants to know, does it count if your neighbors have flowers? Yeah, close proximity, but they have to have a reason to come over. Because I'm telling you, I work really hard to bring the pollinators and beneficial insects to our garden and then to get them to stay here. If your garden is up against their garden, yeah, that would work. That would help. Yeah. But that would plant help. your own flowers. And you know, Greg, what we haven't mentioned, and I think that it's probably one of the most under <laughs> rewarded helper in the garden that people don't understand are birds. Birds play a key role in consuming insects. A chickadee, yes. right? do you know what a chickadee is? Do y'all have chickadees out there? And that's a little teeny bird. Okay, that's just a little teeny precious little bird that's out here. I mean, all over the East Coast and the Mid-Atlantic. When she has a clutch of babies, she eats 2,000 or she gathers 2,000 insects a week to feed them. Wow. So how many birds do we want in our garden? Here's what people <laughs> right? say. Oh, but the birds get my tomatoes. They, 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 you know, hit them with their beaks and, you know, damage them. And, but guess what? Road covers over them. Well, but you know why the birds doing that? They're looking for moisture. Simply having a bird bath or anything that holds water in your garden yes. totally prevents that from happening. Um, and that's a lot of the kind of stuff I talk about in the book, because it's just simple things that we just don't even realize they really have a reason. But anyway, birds are huge around here. Big. Yeah. Yeah. Will covering squash, will covering for squash vine borers work like what you do for flea beetles? Yes. Yeah. We 100% have prevented squash bug damage. Excellent. That's it. Stephanie wants to know, do you cover proper rotation in your book? The, repeat the name of the author of The Native Plant. Oh, Doug Tallamy. Oh my goodness, Dr. Tallamy. If you just, there are so many free videos. He's a speaker, travels all over the country. His book, Bringing Nature Home, changed wow. my life. Mm -hmm. And it described it because see, most people don't understand why natives are so important, just like I didn't. I just thought, you know what I thought native meant 15 years ago? I thought it meant, oh, they must just be easier to take care of because they naturally grow in my area. Mm -hmm. um, you don't understand that native trees have native insects, which feed native birds. And when you don't have right. native trees with native insects, you lose those. I mean, it's an evil. It is a real it is. He is so amazing. He's delightful. And he is changing 
the current. So look at the book, Bringing Nature Home. And, and he has more books. I've got, and I don't remember the names of it. I'm sorry. You need all of his books. They no, will change thank your you. life. So thank you for that. You're so welcome. And you know, Greg, that reading Doug's book, his book is has regions in the back of what, what is native uh, where trees, mm-hmm. shrubs, and you just need to put that high on your list. I wished we had done it years or be the only better time to plant a tree from 20 years ago is today. And today, and, yeah. Um, he is a huge oak tree fan. You know, one oak tree supports like 490 beneficial native creatures. A non-native wow. tree, zero. Yep. You know, it's just a choice. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm try. sure we'll be catching up there. So tell us about your book and your classes as we wrap up. Oh, sure. So people can learn more about what we are all about at thegardenersworkshop.com. I started Flower Farming 25, almost 25 years ago, warped into becoming a speaker and an author and a teacher and moved into the virtual world about five years ago. And so we have lots of online farming, flower-based farming business courses Mm -hmm as well as seed starting and the home garden, cutting garden, just a lot of great resources. I have a podcast called Field and Garden. We just hit a quarter million listens. And so we have a a kind of a mix of, of stuff. It's where it all is. Perfect. 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 Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been a delight catching up and uh, we will do this again. Okay. Welcome back. Greg and Lisa covered so many topics in that conversation. So I'll be adding relevant links from their discussion to the show notes for the episode. And I'll include a link to the Urban Farm podcast so you can check that out as well. Thank you for joining me here on the Field and Garden podcast. I'm Jesse Craven with The Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm-hmm.